This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Hello, welcome back to Audible Bleeding. I'm Adam Johnson, and today we have with us Gustavo Oderich from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He was originally from Porto Alegre, Brazil, but now he is currently the chair of the Division of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery, the program director for the Vascular Surgery Integrated Residency, Traditional Fellowship, and Advanced Aortic Fellowship at the Mayo Clinic. He's also the associate editor for the Journal of Vascular Surgery and on the board of many other prestigious journals, and he's really a pioneer in the fenestrated and branched devices for complex aortic aneurysmal disease. So, uh, welcome to Audible Bleeding, and thank you for your time. So, I guess we'll just get started with, uh, in general, this is for vascular fellows and people starting in their training in vascular surgery. So, can you give us a little bit of story of what brought you to vascular surgery? Sure. So, we have to go back to the like 1995 or so. I, I was a resident in general surgery in Brazil, and I really liked the finesse of vascular surgery. Uh, the idea that at that time already the specialty was changing a very fast pace with the introduction of endovascular procedures. So I thought that that was going to be a very appealing specialty where I would be able to join the skill set of very fine open surgery with the potential to do catheter based procedures. And that was what got me started way back in 1995. And so you were in Brazil at the time? Yes, sure. If I did my medical school there and actually a couple of years of general surgery. And during those two, two years of general surgery, I had the rotations on vascular surgery and had the chance to participate then as an intern or young resident in one of the first endovascular aortic repairs there. At the time, a lot was with uh, modified stents or actually stents that were coming from the U.S., uh, physicians from the U.S. that were coming to Proctor. And I thought that this was really revolutionary, that, uh, that it was going to change everything. And uh, at the same time, uh, I never thought that Brazil was going to embrace endovascular therapy so fast. There were numerous regulations to import devices and uh, my my thought was that I, ha I had to get, kind of get out of the country to be able to train on these techniques. And the options were either to go to Europe or UK or come to the US. And uh, throughout advisors and so forth, I found my way, you know, coming to, to the United States. Uh, first, I uh, started as a research fellow, worked with Peter Lawrence at the University of Utah for one year and then went through the application process and was uh, very fortunate to match in a categorical program at the Mayo Clinic. That, that was then 1999, a few years after that. So I'm sure you had many uh, great mentors. Uh, this is Kevin, by the way, um, throughout your time and helping you through your vascular training. Can you describe you know, some of the characteristics of a good mentor? Yes, Kevin, that's a very good question. I think I was blessed that I had the chance to train through giants of both open surgery and also endovascular surgery. First, uh, for starters, was, I, I guess, Peter Glowiski. I can't not mention about Peter Glowiski. I mean, he's a masterful surgeon and, and person and has really accumulated all the accolades of an academic vascular surgeon, but a masterful surgeon with open skills that are unmatched and uh, also academician. So he was a big mentor. Tom Bauer, has had also a lot of influence on me on how I carry open surgery in general. And I think he was heavily influenced by Ken Cherry, Larry Hollier, Peter Parolero. So I feel that a lot of the things I learned from him, I kind of it inherited from those. Then transitioning to endovascular, the beginning of my vascular surgery training here at the Mayo Clinic, we are back down now to 2004. Uh, I felt that we were very conservative on endovascular and we were kind of behind of what things were doing around the country. And uh, Tim Sullivan was really the one that I would grant that got me started on thinking endovascularly, thinking out of the box, thinking, you know, can you do a less invasive alternative and can you push the limit? 
on cases and can you actually be an independent vascular surgeon working on endovascular without uh, uh, having to have your hand held by interventional radiology all the time and that that I grant to Tim Sullivan but still, even when I came on staff at Mayo, that's 2006, uh, I felt that what I was doing was, uh, was then very good, acceptable, you know, bread and butter vascular procedures, the EVARs, the TVARs, the lower extremity stuff. But I didn't have the, the training on the very complex endovascular. And... It was really working with Roy Greenberg at the Cleveland Clinic that I would say set the course of my career to think about complex endovascular procedures. And I would say that not only on the techniques and specifically how to think about aortic disease and how to plan, but also about how to set up a team, how to set up the research part, how to, to participate in clinical trials and be engaged and interact with industry. And I, I grant that out to Roy Greenberg. He was a masterful endovascular uh, surgeon, uh, skills that are unbelievable, and, and just had the ability to adapt. And I think that is the most important trait for us, uh, and I say for the trainees, is that you have to adapt. Because what, what you're doing now, what we are doing now, and what I was trained, is a lot different than we actually I'm doing. I mean, the way I do cases is very much different than what Roy Greenberg taught me, but he taught me how to think out of the box and how to adapt on planning and conducting these very complex endovascular procedures. What would you say is maybe some of the biggest differences as things have evolved from when you were trained and then to how you do the procedures now? So. Roy always liked to do things through the femoral approach, and he was blessed to have investigational devices at his hand every day. And when I came to Mayo, just like most of the centers in the U.S., I didn't have access to any manufactured device. So he was using creativity and working with others uh, that we started using modified devices. And one of the first things that I came to realize is that using the brachial axis was making those cases much easier, faster, uh, using a staggered approach to deploy the stent so that I could leverage space to get the vessels. So that is that started to set me apart from the traditional, I would say, Greenberg dogma of doing everything from the femoral approach. And to this date that now we use a lot of our cases, the vast majority are done with manufacturer devices. I, I still leverage that. I oftentimes ask uh, preloaded catheters or preloaded wires so I can, I can do the case in actually a similar way as I, I was doing when using uh, physician-modified endografts. The other difference is that uh, the traditional culture of the Cleveland Clinic, and you can see that on several of the people that were trained by Roy, is to use fenestrations no matter what on every case. Uh, the usage of branches, uh, if you look at Stefan's, Karamastrati, uh, is minimal, particularly renal branches. And uh, I'm kind of more in the middle. I'm not only branches, I'm not only fenestrations. I, I came to appreciate the value of a branch when there is a very large aneurysm, a downgoing renal artery. I don't see the point really on using a fenestration. Quite frankly, I think that there are other issues related to fenestrations that are sometimes underestimated. So that's another difference from from my traditional training with Roy. So Gustavo, you know, you have the luxury because you've positioned yourself to have the total spectrum of devices available to you. When do you decide to use a physician modified device in your practice as opposed to a custom device like a branch or fenestrated device? Do you see a role for parallel grafts in your practice as well? Very good question. So I think that uh, an important message is that there is a role for all these techniques, that we have to actually master all these techniques. Uh, but the two techniques, physician modified and parallel grafts, for the most part, uh, originated from the creativity of physicians because of the lack of access to 
industry manufactured devices. If we all had devices at our hand, the vast majority of cases would be done with these devices. They are easier, they are less time consuming, they are devices now with lower profile, with preloaded systems that make the cases faster. So it's really because physicians don't have access that uh, physician modified devices and parallel graphs were started and gained momentum. But having said that, these techniques I don't think will ever disappear. And there are some patients where they have tremendous value and perhaps they are actually the best techniques, better than a manufactured device. We, uh, for example, we use still physician modified devices in a very few patients every year, maybe a handful of patients. These are patients that have an urgency or some situation that they cannot wait for a manufactured device. They have multiple vessels involved, so we don't feel that uh, parallel graft is the best. And uh, the classic scenario would be a rupture, contained rupture pararenal or, or, or paravisceral aneurysm where we don't want to use a T-branch for some reason. Perhaps is too much coverage of a thoracic aorta that is normal or renal arteries that are up going or coming from a relatively narrow aorta. And in those cases, knowing how to do a physician modified device well, I think is a tremendous advantage. The parallel graphs, you ask, and I, I do see role, and I, I'm not one that says that parallel graft is a, an absolute nonsense. I do think that it has been widely used, uh, again, because of lack of access in, to other technology, and I don't think that for physicians that have access to devices, it pays off to do parallel graft on elective cases that can actually be treated well with a branched or a fenestrate graft. Having said that, there are cases that are really bad for fenestrate grafts, uh, patients that have very poor iliac access, uh, uh, patients that have a rupture that you absolutely have no time to waste, and yet you feel you can get a seal with a parallel graft. I think that's the right thing to do. And, and that's, uh, those are the patients I use here. Uh, and also, as you know, our, our access to manufactured devices linked to the setting of, of clinical trials. So these trials have numerous uh, medical and anatomical exclusion criteria. And sometimes you have a very elderly patient with a prohibitive risk that does not quite meet the criteria for the trial. But we feel that there is a, a good anatomy for a parallel graft. That's a case that also we might use that. So I, I'm not one that uh, that say that you know it's it's a nonsense. You should never use. I mean, there is no room for it. I think that there is room for this technique. I just think it has been used uh, much more than what it should, and in part is because physicians don't have access to other devices. Do you do you have any personal experience with uh, in situ fenestration as is described from the group in Paris? I know Halon and his partners have have used that in urgent cases, and and uh, they seem to have good results with that. Have you have you done any of those cases yourself? Sure. No, actually, I was highly critical when the the first paper came up. I actually uh, was uh, one of the reviewers, and I was very critical. And uh, I have to say that. I changed my mind on that. I do think that there might be a role. On our experience, it's probably a very small role. Why? Because we can do a physician-modified graph relatively fast, very accurately. And at the end of the day, I think that the patients have good outcomes with that. So I don't see much of a role on the paravisceral aorta for us. Having said that, uh, we've done it in the arch, and I am really impressed with the technique and the results that uh, uh, Dominique Fabri, who really pioneered the paravisceral insight in Paris, and now Stefan Hallon is working with him, uh, has now come up with a larger series. So I think it's exciting as well. I just want to say for our, our listeners, if you want to do any additional reading on this area, um, Dr. Odich just had a great publication come out in the JVS called The Evolution from Physician Modified to Company Manufactured Fenestrated Branched Endographs to Treat Perirenal and Thoracoabdominal 
aortic aneurysms, where he kind of describes experience at Mayo Clinic. Now with these company manufactured fenestrated branch endografts, do you think this is something that's going to become more mainstream and available to a wider range of vascular surgeons or will be maintained in these centralized academic centers? I think that uh, it will be spread, but when we look at data from how many physicians are trained to how many physicians actually do the cases. Let's look, for example, at the ZFAN. Uh, ZFAN is kind of the first step towards doing complex case. So for every 100 physicians that are trained by Cook, uh, about 5% actually do more than 10 cases a year. And what we don't know is really the difference in outcomes between physician centers that are doing higher volume versus those that are doing less volume. We think that there will be a, a big difference in outcome. If we look at any complex procedure, open toracal, esophagectomies, WIPO, etc., there is a huge impact of surgeon and center volume on outcome. So I do think that as time goes by, and now we have uh, large data sets from Medicare, etc., will be able to start looking at, at those things. But at the end of the day, once these devices become more available, physicians, uh, both in the community and in large centers, will use it. A lot of the limitations are going to be imposed, I think, by cost and uh, perhaps by limitations from the industry to who gets access. But when we look at other procedures that are that add some layer of complexity, TAVR, the Z fans, uh, the ELEC branch devices, it, it has actually spread pretty well through the community. So I think that the same is going to happen with, uh, with the manufactured devices. And in fact, there is a ton of physicians out there doing modified devices. We don't even know how many and what is the volume of that, but I, I have to think that uh, that is, is actually significant. And with these physician modified graphs, with your experience, what's the medical legal discussion around these and the, how much liability do the surgeons take on when they do these modifications? I think they take a huge uh, liability uh, actually. Uh, and, and there are two different scenarios or types of uh, physicians doing this. Uh, one is that you are truly doing very small number of cases on cases that are exceptionally high risk, that you can have a frank discussion with a patient and a family about the stakes without repair, with open surgery, with a physician modified. And it's very critical to get the family on board, to get the patient on board, a consent that is very well formulated, and also have some backup legally from your hospital ahead of time when you do it, the legal department, your uh, your chair or your division chief. If you are doing this regularly, absolutely should be done as part of an IDE. First of all, you don't have any backup to stand if you're doing this on high volumes. You don't even get reimbursed for the entirety of the procedure, so it's a major loss for your hospital. And uh, the FDA is very clear that if you're doing this uh, with the intent of any research, that then is, is a high-risk procedure that you would need an investigation or device exemption. So, Dr. Oderich, what is the next big thing in endovascular treatment of aortic disease? The immediate thing for us is that there is a very exciting time on the next two years where finally there will be clinical trials that will allow access of these devices to a larger number of population in the U.S. The, the GORTAMBI trial is actually already rolling in and, and uh, being submitted to IRBs in many centers. And the Cook trials, in large part, have been accelerated by the fact that GOR has already jumped on this. So finally, I do see that the Cook trials are going to be coming to fruition within this year. Uh, so the good news is there is access that is going to come. So the, the generation of uh, surgeons that is training now, that's graduating, will get their hands into devices. Uh, but there is always advances on these devices that are, gonna, that are coming at a pace that's much faster than what the trials can overcome. 
things like a smaller profile, newer delivery systems, newer designs, uh, newer bridging stands. So the technology is getting better. The procedures are going to become, I think, easier on us technically to do it and easier on the patients with less complications. The next thing that is going to happen, I think, is that, uh, and there is some light on that already, is to go away some of the current paradigms that we have, that all these cases are done under fluoroscopy. For example, there is work uh, already with uh, GPS-guided procedures, uh, fluoroless procedures, and I think that is going to become a reality. And then going to the basic science part, I think that we are, we are still living this uh, on complex aortic disease, this paradigm that we fix everything with stent grafts of fabric and metal. And I do think at some point in the future, there will be work with regenerative medicine and stents that actually are biological, that become incorporated in tissue or that reinforce the aortic wall. And we're a long shot from that, but I do think that that is going to evolve that way. So Gustavo, I have a question. You know, we're talking about this going from being something done in highly specialized centers to possibly being done more widely. What do you think are the basics that you need at a center to do advanced aortic work? So the first thing is you need a team. And when you think about a team, it's not only your surgical team, which is a big part of it, you know, having your partners and uh, uh, their scrub nurse. But then you, you need to have a dedicated uh, cardiovascular anesthesia team, critical care team, the nursing team that is all engaged because there are many parts of these procedures that go out of the OR that are critical for the patient to have a good outcome. Uh, I think the physicians also have to realize it's a lot of work. It's not just the fun of putting that stent in the fenestration. There's a lot of time-consuming work on planning these cases that the physicians have to be truly passionate about it uh, on following up these cases uh, and if you if you are interested on in becoming a big player on this work with research on this area is critical because this is a technique in evolution that we are constantly assessing the outcomes to see what is best and you have to have a big part on that as well and so what do you see as maybe some of the big uh, biggest barriers in advancing this field? Well, I think clearly one of the biggest barriers we have uh, now is, uh, is cost, more and more. Uh, these procedures are just uh, exceptionally costly. Uh, not only the aortic device is costly, but the bridging stents are uh, sometimes even more costly than the aortic device. Uh, now we are doing stage procedures, so we are talking about two operations. The follow-up as well. That's one big barrier because uh, these are not money-making procedures for any hospital or department, at least that's what I'm told. And uh, it's a challenge to, to build a big program when you're not having a positive margin. The, the second issue is still access. You know, access is just limited to like a 0.1% of the centers in, in the world. And that is hopefully going to get better now with some trials and devices getting approved. But there will always be an issue as long as there is regulation and there is going to be evolution of these devices. So I, 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 can, I can see that even when, let's say, the Tambi gets approved, there is going to be the second generation device and, and the Cook device gets approved, there will be the the newer generation device and access is, is always uh, going to be a problem. So I think that there is always room for having pipelines of clinical research that you can get access to things uh, before they actually become commercially available. Going back to the cost a little bit. So some controversy has been in the literature about um, the NICE guidelines out of the UK where they won't reimburse EVAR in a lot of situations and recommend more open treatment, partly because of the device costs, the long-term surveillance and re-intervention. What are your thoughts about the role of open surgery then versus endovascular when you talk about this cost? If you are more of a, a vascular surgeon in the community setting or who has just a patient who needs treatment for their aneurysmal disease. 
So I think there are two things to to say about what's going on in in England and uh, with the and the UK with the nice document. One is the price that we are paying for what's going on with end of aortic repair, which is even though there are numerous early advantages in terms of mortality and morbidity, there are clear cut long term disadvantages which include a higher rate of aneurysm rupture, a much higher rate of aortic related reinterventions, and in some studies even uh, a higher rate of late mortality from aneurysm ruptures. And as we start looking at data from national data sets, all these patients that are being treated way out of the boundaries of IFU and with techniques that are at the best questionable are going to come into surface and hurt the general results of where endovascular therapy can actually be beneficial. Uh, so to me, a little bit of what is happening in the UK is that the committee put an extra emphasis on these late results disregarding the evolution of endovascular technique, all the early benefits that are major in terms of uh, protection from operative mortality that EVAR offers against open surgery, uh, and put too much emphasis on the late part, which is very important, but I think it can be improved and remediated by better devices and better control on which situations the devices are used. So tighter adherence to the IFU and case selection you think would have been resulted in better outcomes? I think, Sheriff, you would have been better and also if we had better tools to tackle those complex cases. But at the same time, again, it put emphasis on how important it is for us to know how to do open surgery uh, because I'm telling you, it's, it's here to stay and uh, you need to do it well. There is less and less people that are comfortable in doing open surgery. And there are patients that are absolutely not a good endovascular case. And again, if you start doing endovascular on those cases, then you expect you have a higher reintervention, you have more ruptures, more mortality. And then later on, looking at the data of these cases, of course, they are not going to perform as well. And you have to keep that in mind when when you look at, at this uh, nice document. I don't know, they're going to revise uh, from my last communications and, and I'm hopeful they are going to come up with a much more reasonable uh, recommendation that actually reflects the practice in the UK and worldwide. So Dr. Oderich, in what situations are you guys performing open aortic repairs um, at the Mayo Clinic, and, and how do you train the next generation of uh, residents and fellows in these techniques? One situation is when endovascular therapy has failed, and we either exhausted reinterventions or we feel that the reintervention is not going to be very effective. And at the same time, the patient is a reasonable open surgical candidate still. That patient is, uh, is a large part of our practice. Those are the conversions. We still do a fair amount of uh, infected aortas, infected endografts, uh, mycotic aneurysms. And then there is a subset of, I would say, very young patients with quite complex disease. They may even be a candidate for a fenestrated or branch repair, but when you have a 50-year-old, 55-year-old with bilateral iliac aneurysms, a juxtarenal aneurysm, and you need to do numerous fenestrations, bilateral iliac branch device, versus doing uh, abdominal aortic repair, even with a juxtarenal clamp, you have to challenge the endovascular because it, it, it's just, I, I think it's even technically sometimes easier to do it open. And on the long run, you may have uh, significant advantages in terms of aortic intervention. The one thing that it keeps us doing endovascular still on these patients is the issue of sexual dysfunction, which always have to be discussed, particularly when we have the younger group. 
That was just a, a wonderful discussion about uh, aortic disease. We're going to pivot a little bit to talk to you about uh, radiation exposure and techniques to mitigate risk for our trainees. Yeah, so I think that has to be a major focus for us that do endovascular procedures. And uh, as we have the trainees uh, involved on this, really get on their minds how important it is that from the beginning they develop good habits about uh, 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 radiation exposure. Uh, it's starting up with, uh, with shielding, uh, you know, shielding yourself, shielding the, the field using glass shields. Uh, we have now, since the last two years after the publication of the a moderate study on circulation, become very attentive about shielding our calf with, uh, with lower leg shields to protect from radiation. There has been a tremendous advance on hybrid imaging. Uh, so when we look at our own data over the years, even after we already have overcome the learning curve, so we kind of plateau in terms of fluoroscopy time, operating time, uh, it was really how much better the imaging uh, technology became that allowed us to decrease radiation substantially. One of the, the, the new features, I would say the advanced features that helped us as uh, only fusion, you know, to avoid doing repeated DSAs and uh, leveraging digital zoom instead of magnification to me that has been the the major factor in our practice that we notice is being able to do an entire toric abdominal case without a single magnification and just using digital zoom we were able to cut uh, the radiation dose as you see on that publication from an average of three gray per four vessel case to 500 to 800 milliray so that has been a, a tremendous improvement. So Gustavo, one question we like to ask most of our interviewers is, uh, is there any technique that you use that has gotten you out of trouble in the operating room? It can be an open technique, an endo technique, but you know, one little thing that you keep up your sleeve that uh, keeps you safe. Well, yeah, one technique that I've used uh, now in a handful of cases uh, is uh, retrograde access to the visceral vessel, so via midline laparotomy. Uh, I'll tell you, sometimes if you are struggling with a case, it's best to fight the battle another day uh, than end up with a case that is excessively long in the operating room with a lot of blood loss, lots of leg ischemia. Uh, patients end up not doing well. So I think over the years, as I, ma I matured on technique and matured on having enough complications with my own patients, I, I pulled that trigger much earlier nowadays. So. Uh, I may actually quit, revisit the case the next day, uh, next week. And on those cases, going back via uh, midline laparotomy and doing some sort of a hybrid approach, retrograde axis, uh, has bailed us out tremendously in several cases that we were able to complete. So is that a case where there's still perfusion of the branch, but you can't bridge it from the fenestration or the or the branch itself? Or, you know, it's different than if it's like covered entirely? No, no. Usually that's the case. Uh, Sharif, you have, a, you are doing a case and you just cannot get into one of the vessels. You try, you try. And I have now a lower threshold to just quit, leave the, leave the, the branch. It's usually perfused, you know. I have not had an issue of that occluding. I guess it can happen, but uh, usually it's not the case. And then just do an incision, put a wire retrograde, and usually becomes a much easier case with less complications. Well, Dr. Odorich, we really appreciate all the uh, great advice. One question we like to ask is, uh, when you're performing these procedures, do you listen to music in the operating room? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. What's on your playlist? Well, you know, I like... Uh, I, I'm very eclectic on that, but I, I, I listen a lot to Coldplay, U2, Dave Matthews Band. That's the style that I like the most. But you know, sometimes it's the nursing and the team that dictates what we listen. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most important thing, I think, with the music is getting something that everybody's happy with, you know? So. Exactly. We have two last uh, questions for you that are kind of fun. Being from Brazil, uh, how have you adjusted to the weather in Minnesota? 
Who said I adjusted? <laughs> <laughs> you cannot adjust to this weather, man. That's why he travels so much for work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I have never adjusted. I live with it, but we are always looking that at some point we are going to move to a warmer place. <laughs> And for the kids, it has been a great place to raise them. And, uh, uh, you know, the the clinic to work has been addictive and, and amazing, you know, allowing us to develop a practice and a team. And that's those are the things that kept me here. Uh, but the weather, we struggle a lot. Uh, you know, it's just uh, too cold. And when it gets to be cold that you can't walk outside, that, that that's bad, you know. So fortunately, this winter so far has been gentle on us. I actually went for a nice run today. Uh, so it was 30 degrees. Balmy. But that is an exception, you know. <laughs> it seems like you stay active in your free time. Um, anything else that you do other than run? Well, uh, we, uh, so we have two kids and uh, we, hang, we do a lot of stuff around the kids so it might be we go to the cities we go to a play or a concert or one of the museums so when we have a break of free time we actually may do something out of rochester usually in minneapolis uh, we have a, a large group of friends here and tend to do social things together again with the families uh, and as as i said i'm very active so i'm always doing some workout, whether it's uh, now uh, biking indoors or running or some, you know, insanity or P90X or whatever is coming up that month, I tend to, to stay active. Have you done Peloton yet? I just got it. Yes. I Mine arrived a week ago and uh, I'm, I'm doing it almost every day. You'll have to come to New York and uh, do one of the live classes with us. That's awesome. I would love to. All right. Well, Dr. Rodriguez, thank you so much for your time. This was an, an amazing discussion. Anything else you want to leave our trainees with? Any final words to close off the interview? I think that uh, my final say is that be very excited about this uh, specialty passionate because is, is this a younger group that's going to shape on how vascular surgery is going to be done? And I can tell you it's promising that it's going to change a lot. And at the same time, be open to change. Uh, because the way you practice 10 years from now might be a lot different from the things you are being trained. Adaptation is key. We are Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. You can find us on social media at Audible Bleeding or online at audiblebleeding.com.